All righty. Good morning, everyone. Merry Christmas. Can y'all believe that we're right here at the end of 2023, about to go into a new year? It's crazy. Do y'all feel like time is just booking it? It's been crazy, y'all. Um, yeah, if y'all don't know me, my name is uh, Stephen Whitley. My, I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, I'm married to Lorena. She was the one who was just speaking or singing in Spanish. Uh, that's because she's from El Salvador. And uh, together, Lorena and I have been married for uh, seven years. <laughs> I had to do the math real quick. Uh, <laughs> Okay. All right. She didn't hear that. All right. If I was wrong, I'd, you know, I'm good. Uh, but yeah, we have a, we have a, a daughter together. Uh, she's a, a year and a half old. And, you know, before you know it, you know, she's going to be driving cars and going to school. And it's just blowing my mind. Um, but I don't know about you, but do y'all feel like this December has been going unusually quick? Like, it's just been blazing fast. And it's, it's weird. It's all these things that I've planned to do. A lot of things that I've planned to do this month in particular, I wasn't able to get to because I was so slam busy. So, for example, Lorena and I have lived in the house that we've lived in since about 2018. And every single year, we put up... Christmas lights inside and outside the house. I just realized I'm in the, in the way. Uh, that's why I need to stop moving around. Um, so every year we've put up Christmas lights inside and outside the house. So this year we started on the inside. You know, we started putting up the, the Christmas tree and the ornaments only to come to, to find out that my daughter is intrigued by the ornaments. And since there's metal hooks on the bottom or attached to those ornaments, you know, we had to be extra careful and making sure that, you know, she's OK. Uh, but after, you know, decorating the tree and decorating the rest of the, uh, the living room and, and the kitchen, uh, we couldn't stop there. We had to make sure that we decorated decorated our bathroom. Yeah, we're one of those people. We decorate our bathroom. And of course, we can't stop there. Uh, Lorena, she actually, um, and maybe some of you ladies do this, she gets these things that you plug into the outlets, and it's got oil inside of it, and it burns the oil, and it makes this really good smell. So, so every time I walk into my bathroom, I'm blasted in this face, in my face, and it smells, no joke, it smells like Christmas spirit. Like I just feel better by going into the bathroom. And then to finish it off, you know, after you wash your hands, we got a little bit of lotion that smells like peppermint. So, I mean, you just become more jolly after using our bathroom. And I'm, I, this might be a weird thing to say, but I'm pretty confident we have the best smelling bathroom in Johnston County. It is incredible. Uh, so we, we decorated everything on the inside of our house. And by the time we were finished, it was getting dark outside. And I was talking with Lorraine. I was like, you know what? We can just do the decorations outside another day because, you know, uh, whenever it's light outside, that's ideally when you put the Christmas decorations up. And, you know, we'll get to it another day. Well, that was about four weeks ago. So unfortunately, we were not able to decorate the outside of our house. Um, and, you know, it's sometimes that's how plans go. You plan to do something, but sometimes life doesn't go according to plan. You know, like just with busyness, uh, I got sick for a whole week. My sister just got married yesterday. No joke. That was the first time I've ever experienced uh, a wedding right around the Christmas season. So that was pretty cool. You know, they're playing uh, Christmas music and, and all that good stuff. But um, but of course, me not decorating the outside of my house, that's that's really a minor thing. That's a, a minor inconvenience compared to, to other things in life, right? There are times where bit our, our plans can change and life can impact us in big ways. So today, as we read this very famous passage of the birth of Jesus, I want you to notice how Mary and Joseph had their own plans for their life. But those plans changed in massive ways. 
So we're going to be in Matthew and Luke today. It's going to be a double header starting in Matthew chapter one, starting in verse 18. And as you turn there, I want you to understand this. The individuals that we read about in scripture, these are real people. And these are people who dealt with troubles, who dealt with hardships in life, just like we do. And sometimes life throws curveballs and those plans have to change. So are y'all ready to jump into God's word today? All right. So Matthew chapter one, and we're going to start at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. So we actually don't know a ton of backstory on Mary and Joseph. Uh, not much has been revealed to us. So what do we, what, what do we know is that they lived in Nazareth. Uh, Nazareth was a small town. It would have been small enough where you would have known most people who lived in that town, which may or may not be a scary thing, right? Um, it, was, it was small enough where you could probably know most of your neighbors. But both Mary and Joseph were likely poor as well. Uh, and they wouldn't have had much. And so they would have had to work hard to get by to have the things that they have. Uh, they were also very young. Believe it or not, most scholars think that they were teenagers, which is, you know, we compare, you know, teenagers today to, to, you know, back then. Teenagers back then were likely, you know, very mature, you know, working jobs, had, had their life together. So it wasn't exactly, you know, one to one ratio. But Joseph is believed to have been a carpenter or Mason. And so if that was the case, Joseph would have likely been someone who was building homes. And in verse 19, which we're not there yet, but in verse 19, it mentions that he was a just man, uh, which again, we'll talk about that in just a second, but it reveals that Joseph was a believer in God. And he would have likely been someone who tried to follow uh, the laws and the commandments of God. And so if we were to look at Luke chapter one, again, another passage where we're not going to cover it today, uh, but the text mentions that Mary was someone who submitted to God's word and it describes her as a woman of faith. So those are some of the things that we know about them. Both Joseph and Mary seem to be the kind of people who wanted to do things the right way. I mean, that's pretty honorable, right? So one thing they also wanted to do right was waiting till marriage to have kids and before being, you know, intimate with each other. In verse 18, as you can see, it mentions that Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Does anyone know what it means to be betrothed? Just curious. Sure. Not quite. So, uh, <laughs> sorry, I kind of set you up there. <laughs> so if you, so if you're betrothed to someone, you technically would be married to that person. However, betrothals were more like contracts lasting for 12 months. And one of the purposes of betrothals was to see if both people, if both parties were committed to each other. And so they would go through this 12 month testing period. And if they weren't committed, if the contract was violated, a divorce could take place. Okay. So not only that, if you're, if you're like me, like this would be terrible. Not only that, if you're betrothed during this 12 month period, there would not be any kind of contact at all. They had to maintain a certain distance from each other. That means there's no kissing. That means there's no cuddling under the blanket, no hand holding. 
the whore. <laughs> so they were married, but they could not be physically together and certainly could not be physically intimate with each other. So, I mean, let's be honest. That sounds like a terrible marriage. <laughs> like, I don't know how long I can last. Um, but if we fast forward 12 months, when the wedding did arrive, it wouldn't be a single day event. Weddings would actually last seven days. Fathers, how many of you would like to pay for the wedding expenses over the course of seven days? Goodness gracious. I mean, I don't want to pay for one, and I know one's coming. But I'm just kidding. I do want to pay for it. I, it'll, I'll just cry in the process. Oh, so, so betrothals were used to see if both people were committed to each other. So Joseph, think about this. Joseph in this moment is finding out during this betrothal period that his girl is pregnant and it's not his baby. Put yourself in Joseph's shoes for a second. How would you react if you were Joseph and Mary comes to tell you that she's pregnant and then God was the one that put the baby there? I'm sure he was thinking, Mary, like, if you're going to lie to me, at least make it believable. So this was another factor that Joseph would have been thinking about. If we can get serious for a second, people in their culture thought quite differently about having kids and having sexual intimacy outside of wedlock. In our culture, if someone has a child outside of marriage, what's, what's the worst that happens? Generally, it's frowned upon, and, but that's about it, right? So for them... Things are different. Watch how things are different. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, it talks about the consequences of having children outside of marriage. And they were serious. Do you know what the punishment for having children outside of marriage was? They would get stoned. And I'm not talking about the recreational kind. They were, I was <laughs> They would take stones... And they would throw these stones at the guilty party, the guilty individuals, and they would keep throwing them at to, at to these people until the committed party were killed. So this was a big deal. So Joseph has all of this going on in the back of his mind. He's freaking out. And because Joseph loves Mary, I mean, he loves her. He didn't want to do that. He didn't want that to be the consequence. He didn't want her to go through that. So let's look at verse 19. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So because Joseph loved her, and not only did he not want her to die, he did not want her to be shamed. So he didn't want her to be embarrassed. So he wanted to divorce her quietly. And in his mind, he could not go forward with the original plan. The original plan was to marry his bride after the betrothal period. But that was off the table now. The plans had changed. So as we see, though, in verse 20, all of this is heavy on Joseph's mind, and he's, he's hurting. He wants to think through all of this before he commits to anything. But as we know, in life, God always has different plans. Let's look at verses 20 through 23. But as he considered these things... Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. 
for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. All right. So now it mentions that Joseph was dreaming when an angel appeared to him. Do y'all think this was like a normal dream that we dream? No. No, when we dream, the things that we dream about aren't real. Every time I dream about eating a massive burrito, it doesn't matter how close I get to it. I can never like taste it. It's never going to sustain me. It's never going to fill me up. It, the things we dream about aren't real. So when it comes to his dream, though, I think it was different. He saw an angel and I believe it was real. Why do I think that? Because of how he reacts. Because of how he reacts when he wakes up from the dream, which we're going to discuss in just a minute in verse 24. But he essentially changes his mind. Before we move on, though, to that verse, I want you to notice something else. Look at verse 21. It says, she shall bring forth a son. Why doesn't the text say, Joseph, you will have a son? Yeah, that's right. It's to reiterate the fact that Jesus was born from a virgin. Know this, Joseph is never called the father of Jesus. Even in the genealogy, if you look at the first 16, 17 verses, look at, I mean, go ahead and look there real quick. Look at the first 17 verses. It says the name, you know, the father of the name, so-and-so, the father of, of so-and-so. But when it gets to Joseph near the end, it says in verse 16, Joseph, the husband of Mary. It words it this way because Jesus was Joseph's legal heir, but not Joseph's legal offspring. The Bible is very careful about, the Bible is very careful about never naming Joseph as the father of Jesus. Jesus was always going to be born from a virgin. And before we transition to the end of the chapter, I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to, because it'll be on the screen. Yeah, there we go. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, doesn't that look familiar? Oh, yeah, that's what we just read in verse 23. The angel was quoting a verse from the Old Testament. So this was a promise that was given to people in the Old Testament, and that promise was being fulfilled right then. And God was with them, and his name was Jesus, Emmanuel. So how does Joseph respond to all this? Let's go ahead and look at verse 24 and 25. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So Joseph decided to trust the words that the angel spoke to him and did this by not leaving his wife, Mary. And the text reminds us again in verse 25, that because they were still in the betrothal period, they were not physically intimate with each other until after she gave birth to Jesus. I do find it funny that the Bible has sometimes different lingo than we do. Like they say, oh, he, he, never, he never knew her. You know, and sometimes if you say that in different contexts, you know, like, hey, like, are you talking about like the biblical version of new or don't, you know, anyways. That was tangent. Uh, <laughs> so that's part of the story. 
So let's jump to Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 1, to see how this unfolds. Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 1. Y'all ready? Ready, ready? Okay. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius, I think I said that right, Quir Quirinius, close. close enough, was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. Okay, so after reading these three verses, it'd probably be easy for us to wonder why these three verses are included. They seem very random. I'll tell you why. The Bible is not just a book that guides us spiritually. It's also a history book. That's it. <laughs> so these three verses are telling us the current state of the world at that time. So the Roman Empire, you know, we've heard about them quite a bit over the years. The Roman Empire was in control and a decree went out requiring a census to take place uh, every few years, um, which from this point on, uh, the census, this uh, thing would actually take place every 14 years for them. Do y'all remember a few years ago, it was, uh, it was like in 2020, I think, where they sent out the census to all of us, trying to find out how many people were in your household. And then they said, hey, if you don't fill this out, we're going to send someone over to your house to knock on your door until you answer. I was like, okay, I'm just going to avoid all that. Uh, so I went ahead and filled out the paperwork. Um, so this is what they were trying to do. They were trying to, to get a census. The Roman Empire was trying to do the same thing. Uh, but it was for the purpose of registering young men for the military service. Um, and in the future, they were going to use the census to uh, gather information for tax purposes, which, as you can imagine, uh, did not go over well with the Jewish people. So as we're going to see in the next few verses, this impacts Mary and Joseph in a big way. So let's go ahead and read verses four through six. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Ladies, you should know the answer to the question I'm about to ask you next. The question is this. When a woman is about to give birth, is it wise to travel far from home? No. Uh, so no one would travel when they were about to give birth. I remember even a few years ago. Uh, Lorena was asked to go to a summer camp to be a chaperone. And when she was asked that, she was like, I politely uh, decline uh, because Harper was about to be born, I think, within like the next month or so. And so she knew that if she had gone, it would have been incredibly risky. So if Mary and Joseph are having to go to a different town to be registered, right around the time that she's supposed to give birth. To me, it seems like this census was mandatory because this, them leaving at this point defies logic. I highly doubt that they left by choice. I believe they planned to stay in Nazareth, but those plans changed and they had to go to Bethlehem. The distance to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem, get this, 71 miles. And they would have been going through mountainous terrain. And so this would have been quite brutal on Mary. This would have been hard for her, even if she had transportation. And as they were in Bethlehem, it was time for her to give birth to Jesus. So, why would God make them go through this? It's prophecy. Why, why, so why, why did God want them to go to Bethlehem? Well, because of the Old Testament. 
If you, if you want to take a note, uh, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, prophesied that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. So God orchestrated this random world event, this random registration, this random census, to make sure that scripture, to make sure that what was prophesied would actually happen. It's pretty cool, huh? No. All right, let's jump to verse 7. Verse 7, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes or cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. So the whole reason Jesus wasn't born in the inn was because it was full of people. You know, there's no space left. And so I, I, there's a good chance that it was full because of all the people traveling because of the, the registration, because of the census. And so notice how every time, every time Mary and Joseph plan to do something, it does not go the way they hope. It does not go according to plan. Instead, what happens? The manger scene. The iconic manger scene happens. Do you realize that the manger scene likely didn't look like what we envision it to look like? Uh, Matthew, you could go ahead and put the picture up. See, doesn't that look all like peaceful and, and nice. Um, do y'all think that it looked like this? No. I highly doubt it was clean. I highly doubt the animals were singing Kumbaya. <laughs> I mean, you probably got things stinking in every corner. I mean, like, it's not peaceful. Mary also wouldn't have had much help either. So there was no nurses, there were no beds, there was no comfort. This was not a great scenario for them. Uh, the only thing that Mary would have had access to was, was her husband. And we can only hope that he was more you know, prepared than some of us men whenever we see the birth of our first child. Um, yeah, I was, I was not prepared for that. Um, all right, so the manger. Do you all know what that is? Go ahead and put a picture of that. It's a feeding trough. It's where the animals would eat their slop and their food. Notice how the, the text says, or, or doesn't say, that they were in a stable or cave. The reason some people believe he was born in a stable or cave is because that's generally where you would find a manger. And by the way, that does not look clean at all. Hopefully they put some straw or something. Um, so this whole scene looks pretty unremarkable. It doesn't sound like an impressive place. But we know that this was an incredible moment. In fact, it was the most, one of the most important moments in human history. Because Emmanuel was born, had arrived. God was with them. And the people could finally see him with their own eyes. And something else incredible happens as well. Uh, we won't read the rest of the verses due to time, but look at verses 13 and 14. And suddenly there was an angel, a multitude of, a, of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Do you know what a multitude of heavenly host is? A whole lot of angels. Uh, we actually don't know the exact number. Uh, in fact, it could have been too many to count. The word host, though, means an army encampment. There was an army of angels praising God 
which showed proof that Jesus wasn't just a normal baby. He was something special. And I'm sure that would have been an incredible sight. And based on what we know about angels, remember angels aren't like the cute little babies that cartoons and pictures have described them to look like. Angels, biblical angels are scary. <laughs> so I'm sure it was, I'm sure everyone who saw it had all the emotions, all the feels. So as the band comes up, do you think Mary and Joseph ever planned for any of this? Do you think they ever expected their lives to be changed like this? As we finish up this year, finish up the year 2023, I believe we can all look back on the last few years and acknowledge that not a whole lot has gone according to plan. The world seems to be getting crazier. Uh, things are getting really expensive. It's just getting harder and harder to live by. But do you think any of this catches God by surprise? No matter what happens in this life, our plans do not compare to God's plans. Because God's plans are always greater than our plans. Father, we just want to thank you for your church. We want to thank you that you sent your son in humility. That he was revealed to us. Because without Jesus, we wouldn't have hope. Father, we're so thankful for not only the fact that you came, but that eventually of what you did on the cross and that we can never say thank you enough. We, we don't deserve anything that you've given us, but you give everything. You give your grace and your mercy and your salvation so freely. We love you, Jesus. We say this in your name. Amen. Do you know what God's plan is for your life? It's not to be comfortable. It's not so you can retire early. It's not that you can have all your plans go perfectly. This is God's plan. First Timothy chapter two says that he desires that all men be saved. That you and everyone that you know would believe in the name of Jesus. And that you would repent of the sins. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, a verse that we, we say so often because it's important. Romans chapter 10 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. That's God's plan. He wants to save you. He wants to save me. He wants to save mankind. But he also wants to save your family. He wants to save your coworkers, everyone that you know. That's why we talk about evangelism so often. Because how are they going to be saved if we don't speak God's word to them? And we know, like, 
having conversations with family, especially if they're not super receptive about this. Gosh, I know it can be hard, it can be uncomfortable. But eventually we're all going to run out of time. So as we're all opening our Christmas presents, either tonight or, or tomorrow, um, as you enjoy your time with your families um, and enjoying the decorations, remember why we celebrate Christmas. Because he was born and lived a sin sinless life, and eventually because he died on a cross for our sins and rose again three days later, and because he came and did what he did, we now all have a way to be saved, and it's all because of Jesus. So we love you guys. Have a good Christ have a great Christmas, and we will see y'all for our New Year's Eve get together party, whatever we're calling it. New Year's Eve bash. Yeah. <laughs>